you to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll go back to our scripture reading, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. We have visitors with us. We are thankful for your attendance. We're grateful to have you with us. The fact that you've decided to be here this morning is an encouragement to us, and you need to know that. I do have some wonderful news for Northwest Church of Christ, this local body of Christ that works and serves in the Lord. I received some very encouraging news about this congregation last week that I would love to share with you. So before we begin our study, I want to tell you what happened last week. David and Dana Carroza, they are the co-founders of Sacred Selections. They are the reason that Sacred Selections exists and operates. They're the heart and soul to everything that takes place there. They were here last weekend for the Sacred Selections event in San Marcos. And so they chose, because they were flying out of Austin, they chose to come here and to worship with us. And I want to say to you, I think some of you talked to them and some of you saw it in their face and in their eyes, but they were excited, uh, overly excited, I would say, uh, to be here and to get to know some of us. The reason why this is important, not because they are the co-founders of Sacred Selections, because what that means. They travel all over the country for these Sacred Selections events. Most of them, these big events, are held on Saturdays, and so they will typically worship in that same city the following Sunday before they head home. There are 10 major events throughout the year, and I'm telling you, they're all over the country for these events. And so they attend a lot outside of their local work, and they have seen many congregations. That's why this matters. David specifically was especially excited about the Bible class. Elliot, thank you. He was very very excited about our Bible class. He said he'd never seen the level of good participation in any other place that he's been. And he said that class was well taught by Elliot. He mentioned him by name, and all of the comments were helpful for the study. And they all came from God's Word. So he's explaining to me that usually what he'll see is a class teacher will get up in a Bible class, and he'll ask a question, and there's crickets. And so the teacher realizes, I'm just going to press on and deliver my material. And it didn't happen here. And they were take, both of them were taken back by that. Not just one person who was kind of ruling the class in their comments, but a broad arrangement of people raised their hands and gave comments that were in line with God's Word. And, and it, it's important for us because it is important. But it's such a great testament to who we are here locally at Northwest. You know your Bible because you've decided to know your Bible. He told me, as we had lunch together last week, that churches have personalities. And I, you know, I, I preached a lesson on that a couple of years ago as we were talking about gospel meetings and why we have them. And I was telling all of you, we got to get our act together. We got a visiting preacher coming. Uh, we want to want to make a good impression, you know, those kind of things. The reality is, is that churches do have personalities. They're known for something. Last Sunday, he saw a church that is filled with Christians who love one another. They told me that. And they are very kind to their visitors. They know that because they visited us. Christians that are reading their Bibles, and they know what it says. The atmosphere and the general feel was very warm and inviting. So I wrote those things down. I thought you needed to hear that. That's what's being said about you outside of these walls. And I thank God for that. They're not the only ones. Mark Thomas is the auctioneer for Sacred Selections. He, too, travels all over the country. He's an auctioneer for all kinds of events. Um, and he's told me that he's, he's visited us three times, and he's told me that each time he comes, he goes back to his home congregation and, and, and tells the elders, we got to start doing this. And it's, it's been different things, but it's, it's the response to, to the visitor card that he filled out. We have, we have four or five people who write him a note saying, thank you. We're, we're glad that you have a sincere interest in the truth. And he said, that changed his week. And so he's telling his elders, we, we got to implement some of these things. This is important. This means stuff. Uh, this means something to people who receive these letters. So I just, I can't thank you enough. And I think that when those things are said and I catch wind of it, I need to report that to you because we're serving God. We're here to glorify God first and foremost. But there's so many benefits in that process of serving God. So thank you. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and start with a word that is certainly appropriate for what I've said so far this morning. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Our study will come from these passages. First thing I want us to see is Peter says, Beloved. It is 
dearly beloved or dear friends, as Eliot read for us. That's accurate translation. Dear friends. Peter makes a loving plea to his beloved brethren in the church. He calls them beloved. That's a big word in the Bible. This is a special term that is also used as a title for the Messiah. You know that? Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7, 17, the Lord God says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is beloved beyond all others by the God who sent Him. This gives it the sense of being divinely loved as those who are loved by God and those who are loved by Christ and those who are loved by one another as saints. We love one another. And so when he speaks to them, he says, Beloved. And then the very next thing he says is, I beg you. Imagine how these first readers would receive this letter. Beloved, you know I love you. I'm begging you. I am begging you as you walk through this life, as sojourners and pilgrims. He's not simply commanding them as an apostle, and he can. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he can say, do it. Do not offend God. Get serious in your life. That's not his approach, and we need to take note of that. Some translations say, I beseech you, which literally means come alongside. So he's saying, beloved, those who I love and cherish, come with me. Come alongside me, and let's do this work together. He is an apostle. He is a preacher. He's an elder. He is a leader in the Lord's church, and he has every right to command them to do this. But he says to them instead, let's do this together. Join me in this fight. And that is so important for us. It's an encouraging passage for elders, for deacons, and for preachers. When an elder, a deacon, or a preacher has to encourage a brother or sister in Christ who they love and who they care about, they need to take note of the wording here. The elder or the preacher who approaches someone who is in sin should say, I'm not insisting that you do something for the Lord all by yourself. I'm begging you as one that I love. I want you to come with me and join me in this fight. That, that's a much better approach. It's not, we know what you're up to. It's, we're in this together and we need you to come back with us. Stand with us. Become stronger in this. Those are encouraging words. And by the way, it's not just for elders and preachers. It's for all of us. Every one of us may have an opportunity to go to someone and encourage them or to bring them back to the faith. Uh, beloved is such a good word. I beg you, because I love you, come with me. He calls them sojourners and pilgrims. And, and that's my title is We Are Pilgrims. That's the reality of all of this. Sojourners and pilgrims. This is how he greets them in the introduction of his letter. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He calls them pilgrims as he begins this. So it's a consistent idea for Peter. They are pilgrims of the diaspora. It is used especially of the Jews who were living outside of Palestine. The Jews who were scattered. Let me show you something in John's Gospel. John chapter 7 and verse 34. John 7 and verse 34. Jesus is saying some difficult things to the Jews. Watch how they respond. First in verse 34, Jesus says, You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? That's the same word. Does he intend to go outside of Palestine, to go out to the dispersion, to where the Jews are cast out or outside of Palestine, where they are dwelling amongst the pagan or amongst the Greeks? Is that where he's going? Is that why he's saying we cannot follow him? The idea is you're a pilgrim. You're outside of your comfort zone. You're in a different country. We are, we are gifted here at Northwest to have many who've traveled abroad. I'm looking out. I see many who have been to foreign countries. And I, I can only wonder. I've been to Mexico. But I can only wonder what, what that's like uh, to go to a foreign country where people are talking and you have no idea what's going on. 
I'll tell you one thing that's interesting about going to a foreign country that I've thought about is if you go to a, go to a foreign country where you don't know the language and, and you're, you're kind of just walking down the street and you hear all this, it just sounds like gibberish. It's constantly coming into your ears and all of a sudden you hear someone say, it's a fine day today in your language. You know what you do? You're like, who, who said that? There's an American around here. Someone speaks my language. Where are they? I want to see them. I want to talk to them. Pilgrims. Don't we do the same thing as Christians? Don't we do the same thing? I heard yesterday watching the PGA Tour that the man who was w winning the tour cur currently, it's, they said that he met his caddy in a Bible study. And my ears perked up. I said, that's phenomenal. I don't hear the NBA talking about Bible studies. I don't hear the NFL talking about Bible studies. But my ears perked up because that's my language. That's who I am. I'm not from this place. This is not where my kingdom is. My citizenship is in heaven. And so when you find a Christian, it's a glorious thing, and it should mean so much to us. This idea is given to us in Hebrews 11 as well. Look at Hebrews 11 with me. And we'll see, we're going to focus on Abraham and Sarah. Hebrews 11 and verse 13 just after talking about Abraham and Sarah, the writer says these all died in faith, not, re not having received the promise, Hebrews 11, 13, but having, been, having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham and Sarah traveled to a foreign country, actually to many foreign countries. They were in the beginnings of following God's will and His instruction, following His testimonies, while living around strangers who were doing all kinds of crazy things religiously. Abraham and Sarah. Strangers, foreigners, pilgrims. Why were they there? Because God told them to go. And so they're challenged by this. They're in a foreign country. They don't know these people. They don't know their customs. In Genesis 23, Abraham says this when he buys a field for a bur burial place. He buys land from the Hittites so that he can bury his wife, Sarah. And he says to them, I'm a foreigner and a visitor among you. Please let me purchase land that I may bury my dead. It's common conversation with Abraham. I'm not from here. I don't know you very well. I don't belong here. I was sent here by the God who called me. Now, I think as we look at this idea of pilgrims and sojourners, at least for me, the, the mindset is, okay, so I'm just going to put my head down and get through this. I don't belong here. I don't know these people. They don't speak my language. So I'm just going to get to heaven as quickly as I can and try not to be plagued by the world. The Bible doesn't say that. But look at Colossians chapter 3 with me. We, we don't want that to be our conclusion. We're not just pilgrims passing through. We, we have a mission. We have a, a calling from God to do some specific things. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So there it is again. We're, we're not from here. Our mind is on heaven. Verse 2, Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Notice in verse 5 that Paul begins to explain the necessity for abstaining from all kinds of wickedness because he, he explains to us the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. We will see the same type of exhortation in 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy with me. Because we're coupling this idea of being a pilgrim and a sojourner and that which we've been asked or required to do while on the earth. Concentrate on heaven. That's the message. Concentrate on heaven. Don't let the cares of this world bog you down. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. 2 Timothy 2, 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. 
the Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What a powerful verse. The Lord knows you. He knows you by name. If you are calling on the name of Jesus Christ, if you are naming the name of Jesus Christ, depart from iniquity. It is always the same. We are heavenly minded. We cannot live in sin. Verse 20, But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. The Lord knows those who are his. So let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Paul says, there's a great house. And boy, is there. We are told in Revelation that the saints are innumerable. There's a great house. And you're a vessel in that house. If you're, the, if you're a member of the Lord's church, you're a vessel in His house. Some for honor. Some for dishonor. Paul has told Timothy at great length of those who are in the church who are causing division and who are teaching false doctrine. That's dishonor. There are some there, some precious vessels of God who are there for honor. You are in God's house, if you're a member of the Lord's church. You are a vessel. Paul says in the Corinthian letter that God has entrusted to us the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, and he has placed that treasure in earthen vessels so that we may not boast, but that God would be glorified. So it's not a matter of saying, well, am I gold or am I clay? Because I want to be gold. That's not it. There are vessels in the house. When you walk into a house in the customary time that we're reading this, there are vessels. Some are of water, and it's clear, pure water. It's drinking water. There are other vessels that are set out by the master of the home that are used for washing your hands and your feet when you enter the room, when you enter into that home. Those vessels are useful for the master. And they're used according to his will. Some for honor, some for dishonor. And we may say, well, I don't want to be the foot washing vessel. We're commanded to wash each other's feet. You should long to be that vessel. You are useful for the work in the master's house. That's what we want. We are earthen vessels. We're created by God. In the book of Romans, God, uh, Paul tells us by inspiration that God's the potter, we're the clay. How can we look to him and say, what have you done? That he takes each vessel and uses it for his purpose. It's all over the New Testament. We are vessels. We are earthen vessels. Some for honor, some for dishonor. And, and you know this in your own home. There are vessels in my home that I am looking for an opportunity to throw in the trash. But I can't. I'm not allowed to. Because they're useful to the master for some good work. Of which I'm still not aware of. Because some of these vessels are a pain in my neck. But I'm just as guilty. I have vessels that we dare not throw away. They're important to me. And yet any human being who saw them would think, that belongs in the trash. No, it doesn't. It's mine. And it's useful. I do something with that, and it serves me well. You see, see the, the picture here? The, the house is glorious because it's spacious. There's room. There's room in the kingdom. The house is more glorious than that because of the master himself. It's his house. And it's made by him and it's made for his purpose. We are vessels in that house. In 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, Peter told us as pilgrims and sojourners, as these vessels of God, we are to abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. And in verse 22 of 2 Timothy, which is why I chose this passage, this idea that, that we've named the name of Christ, we're going to depart from iniquity, we're vessels of God for honor and not for dishonor, we are striving to do that, we're trying our very best. But 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, the very next thing Paul does after saying that, that we can cleanse ourselves from the latter and be vessels for honor, he says, flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
So we're told immediately, well, how do I become a vessel? How do I become a, a vessel of honor for God? Right here. Flee youthful lusts. He immediately jumps into the warnings, just like Peter did when he said, you are pilgrims and sojourners, you are my brethren, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What are youthful lusts? Well, it's in the term. When we were younger, those of us who are, who are older, when, when we were younger, we can look back and remember some things we argued about that just weren't worth our time. And yet we would argue sometimes to blows about what was important to us. It's youthful. It's childish. Uh, it doesn't lead anywhere. And it took us time, didn't it? As we grow and mature, it took us time to realize, I'm not going to engage in those conversations anymore. Youthful lust, the, the youthful desire to be right. So I've heard kids argue about you know, the Spider-Man movies. Who, who's the best Spider-Man? Who, who played the best Spider-Man? And, and you throw that question out in a room of teenagers and watch them go to blows. Because everyone has an opinion. Is it worth my time? Is this where God wants me to be? And so as we grow and mature, youthful lust, and by the way, it absolutely means lust of the flesh, which is also a problem for our youth as they begin to wrestle and deal with those challenges. Flee those things. The, the picture given by Paul is run. Run. Don't stand there. Don't look at it. Don't do a second take. Run passionately, devoted to God, knowing that it will drag you down to hell. You run with all the power you have. Don't stand there. Don't find yourself there. Do not be caught there. Run. And then he says, pursue. Run away from youthful lust, but pursue. It's really the same term. Diligently pursue. What? Righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Am I doing that? Do I diligently pursue these things? Faith, righteousness, love. That takes work. It takes time. But I should be pursuing it with everything I have. Because it is my calling. Because it is the assurance I have of heaven to be with God and to be with His Son forever. Let's just read it together. So, the idea, we're pilgrims and sojourners, and yet at the same time, we can't just put our head down, ignore the world, and, and just get, our, get to the finish line. Watch what Paul says about our behavior as Christians, those who name the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 23, for all brethren in Christ, please notice, we're going to read it carefully, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. We're back to Spider-Man, aren't we? Don't do that. You have to be able to see those disputes and say, this is, not, this is not good for me. I don't belong here. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Vain strife. And a servant of the Lord, that's you. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. There it is. We can't just fly through this life and say, hey, I'm just a pilgrim. Don't ask me. I don't know. I've got God's promise, and I'm just going to hold on to it and get to the goal. We can't do that. We are supposed to be determined to go to people with the truth. Don't quarrel. Be gentle be able to teach, which means we have the Word of God in our lives. It's in our heart. We are ready to talk about those things. Be able, be prepared to teach. And then, when you're ready to teach and you're ready to go get them, be patient. Because your job is to plant the seed. And anyone who's planted a seed knows what patience is about. It won't be up with fruit on it tomorrow. You have to wait. It's not different when we sow the seed of God. Be patient. And then on top of that, now that we got patience mastered, we do, don't we? Now that we got patience mastered, be humble and correct those who are in opposition. That's the world. Humbly correct them. You can say to anyone who's opposing God or offending God, my creator will not put up with that kind of language. My God won't let me stay in this room as long as you're talking that way. 
my God won't allow me to go to that movie because he knows what's best for me. I correct those who stand in opposition, not to me, to God. I'm a servant, I'm a vessel. I'm still there at the door for their feet and their hands to be washed. I'm humble because I know I'm just a vessel for the use of the master. And in my humility, I do correct. I do say what needs to be said as that pitcher of water that washes the hands. I know your hands are dirty. That's why I'm here. Wash yourself with what I have to offer. A vessel in the great house of God. If God will perhaps grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. These people we talk to and and dwell with daily in our lives are lost. They are under the sway of the wicked one, Ephesians chapter 2. He directs their ways. We can rescue them and we should strive to do that. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. There it is. That's what we've been talking about. It's exactly what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. We're not just passing through. We are trying to bring others with us to come to know the Lord. Even, as Peter told us, even as they, if they start out speaking against us as evildoers. You notice that in verse 12? They may be speaking out against you as an evildoer, but that they may glorify God by your good works. Then in humility, and in, in, in your standing up for the truth, and in presenting that with patience, that, that it, there, there will come a point in their life where they're going to glorify God by your good works. Because you consistently stayed on the path that God provides and you were courageous enough to say the truth to those who need to hear it. It's the good works that they observe. It's not something you just dreamed up that, yeah, I'm going to get better at that. It's something they watched, they saw it in your life, and it will cause them to glorify God. Peter says something very interesting in the day of visitation. There's a lot of debate about what that means. I think most people, the conclusion is it's the day of judgment. And I understand that. I I see that. Uh, The day of visitation. The day when God visits them. They're going to glorify God by our good works. I'm, I'm okay. I'm settled in that. I believe that. But can I share something with you? Because I believe that in the context, as Peter writes it for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, could it not be that it's when the unbeliever comes for the first time to investigate the truth? the day of visitation, that God it, throughout history has revealed himself. He's visited man, and, and man has no, take note of it, and, God, and man visits him in looking into it because of our good works. It makes perfect sense here that they would glorify God, not on the day of judgment. The day of judgment, they're going to be on their knees trembling in fear because they are lost and condemned. But now, that they may glorify God by our good works. It it ties into what Paul told Timothy, that if God grants them repentance and permits that to take place, that's the best possible outcome. And would they not glorify God in that day of visitation when they themselves looked into the Word of God for themselves to see the truth? The day of visitation to me is when the truth is set before us. I want to give you two examples as we close this morning. Look at Luke chapter 1 and verse uh, 76, Luke 1 and verse 76. This is the prophecy of Zacharias. He is seen Jesus, the child, the Messiah. And Zechariah begins to prophesy, Luke 1 and verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare His ways to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high has visited us. You see that? The day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way 
of peace, the day spring which God has given from on high has visited us. Is that not the day of visitation when Christ was here and set before Zacharias as a young child? God is with us. It is then the day of visitation. Look at Luke 19. Because the day of visitation does have different meanings and different impacts on those who are visited. Luke 19 and verse 43. Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. His heart is broken over this city who refused to turn back to their God. Verse 43, Jesus says, For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So when was their day of visitation? Jesus says, it's here right now and you don't see it. You don't know it. And God's wrath is coming. How did God accomplish that? Through the Roman army. They besieged the city of Jerusalem and they tore it down. Utterly destroyed. 70 years after, approximately, 40 to 70 years after this time. You see, when Jesus speaks the truth, He says it like it is. He tells people what they need to hear, and it is their day of visitation. The same is for us. I want to urge you this morning, don't, don't be afraid to tell someone the truth. Every precious soul in this room, every precious soul in this room know someone who needs to hear the truth. What we want is for this moment, when we reach out to our loved ones and those who need to return to the Lord, those who need to obey the gospel, what we want is for that to be their day of visitation. This time, when I call you this time, when I see you this time, that you would look back into God's Word and you would glorify God by our good works, but by our living out the truth. Not because we're special, because we're vessels. We are used for the Master's use. And He's purposed in our lives what He wants us to do. As sojourners and pilgrims who know where we're going, our kingdom is not of this world, that's crystal clear. Look to mankind around you and help them along life's road. Tell them the truth. May their day of visitation be a glorification to God and to God alone. You need to respond to the gospel invitation. That invitation's here for you. We want you to come forward. We want you to confess the name of Jesus Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins, to repent of those sins, to turn away from those things, to step into God's glorious light, coming up out of baptism, a new creature, giving your life to God for the rest of your life, knowing that if you're faithful unto death, He will give you the crown of life. If there's anyone here who has a need or a concern that the, the church needs to hear about, it's an invitation for you as well. Please come forward while we stand and sing.